Welcome back. We turn now to questions of fair pay for workers on local government contracts. We now welcome Jason George, a Ham Lake resident who is also the political director for Operating Engineers Local 49, a union primarily representing uh, heavy equipment operators and construction projects. Uh, Mr. George recently approached the Ham Lake City Council uh, about a prevailing wage ordinance in that city. Jason, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Ted. Good to have you here. Uh, could you give us a little background on prevailing wage laws in general and how uh, they, what they accomplish for a city like Ham Lake? Sure. Um, the prevailing wage term, the, the laws, stem from uh, a federal law, uh, the Davis-Bacon Act. Uh, two Republican congressmen, uh, Davis and Bacon, uh, decided they were having issues in their communities with contractors coming in from out of town, from the south, quite frankly, bidding projects in New York, which is where they were from, and un severely underbidding their local contractors because they were willing to bring with them cheap labor from the South. And they, they had an issue with that because they saw it undermining the, the local uh, standard of living in their area. So they the, what the, what their idea was is that each community should be able to set their own standards for what they, you know, area standard wages for construction workers. And that's what the prevailing wage is. Um, the federal law, the feds have it for any federal dollars on any projects, you have to pay Davis-Bacon. It's up to each individual state if they want to go that route, they can. 25 or more states have done that. Minnesota is one of them. So any state projects have prevailing wage on them. And it's up to each locality or city or school district to decide if they value that in their community and they can make the same choice. One of the arguments that I've heard about prevailing wage laws is that they're designed so that union contractors get all the work. Uh, is that the case? No, and nowhere in any of the language of any prevailing wage ordinance that I've ever seen, the federal, state, or any local one, does is mention the word union. Uh, it really doesn't have much to, or anything to do with unions. It has to do with the area standard wages for construction workers, not union and non-union. Uh, for instance, uh, in some ways you could argue that it helps non-union workers more uh, because often union workers make above the area standard wages and non-union workers don't. So when, when a, I'll give you a for instance, when a, if, if I work for a non-union contractor and, and my, my boss gets a job in, let's say, Ham Lake had it, and I make less than what the area wage rate is determined for Ham Lake, I would, he would have to pay me, he would have to give me a raise for that job. So the non-union workers actually benefit, some could argue, more than the union, the union workers. They would have to give you a raise at least for that job. Just for that job. Yep. But if, if there's prevailing wage ordinances all around that community, the standard of living for that worker is going to increase. So if this is designed to keep um, you know, lower cost, cheap labor from coming from other areas, could this actually benefit local contractors as well? Absolutely. The ones that are willing and, and you know, there's, there's tons and tons of good contractors out there that want to pay their workers a, a living wage, to be able to support their family. It's in, the, it's in the contractor's best interest. If you're paying somebody a good wage and they're happy at home, they're able to provide for their family, they're going to do a much, much, better job, much better at the job. They're going to be much more secure. They're not going to, the turnover rate is going to be lower. They're going to be happy, more productive workers. So, I, and, and by putting these laws in place, it protects those contractors, those local contractors that want to pay their workers in the community a good wage from being undercut by people from outside of our community that don't care about anything that goes on in our community. They care about lying in their pockets. So what prompted you to approach the Ham Lake City Council about this at, at this time? Well, recently uh, I moved to Hamlake uh, about a year and a half, two years ago, and I, I found, came to find that we didn't have a prevailing wage ordinance, and I knew that there were several, several around our community that, that did have a prevailing wage ordinance. And being from the construction trades, I, I know what, what, how hard uh, construction workers work. I know that a standard of living is very important to them. They have short careers. They need health benefits. They need pensions. They need a good wage. And I thought it was important when I looked at the type of people that live in, live in our community. And one of the reasons why I work, move there is because it's a, I think it's a, at, at its heart a blue collar community of workers. And I thought it was important and for this, the Ham Lake City Council to reflect the values of our community. And I think the values of our community are we support blue collar working class people.
So now you, you mentioned there are other cities that have prevailing wage ordinances in the area. Can you give us a few examples? Yeah, Fridley, uh, Coon Rapids, East Bethel, uh, Anoka County has it, Anoka Hennepin School District has it, Andover has it. Um, so, as, I mean, that's pretty much all around us. Uh, and as you mentioned, the federal and state funded projects Absolutely. already require it. So to, to the extent that um, federal or state or county dollars even are, are being used on projects in Ham Lake, we're already paying prevailing wage yep. there, is that right? That's right. And uh, a little side note, the Ham Lake has what they call the Ham Lake Community Development Organization. They get money from the county to build businesses in, in Ham Lake. And part of the requirement that they have when they get that money is that those businesses pay their workers a living wage. So I don't understand why it's so controversial if we're going to build an office building and put workers in there and we're, requiring, we're saying that it's important to pay them a living wage in our community. Why, why not the people that build the building? Why are office workers more important than the people that build the building for us? You mentioned this got kind of controversial, and yeah. it, it sounds like it did on the council. How did the council members end up voting on this? How did they end up falling on this? Did they even take a vote for, for one thing? They didn't take an official vote, uh, Ted, despite the fact that we had 40 uh, community members uh, in the city council chambers that night. Eight contractors wrote letters in support, local contractors. Uh, not one person spoke against it. All they, the, the issue at hand was whether to move it forward for an official vote that night, and they chose not to. Uh, the, the mayor... Paul Mounier was a, uh, stood strong for the workers of our community. He showed his values, and we appreciated that. Uh, Kirketty, Johnson, Braystad, and uh, Thadowski, I think, was the other woman. Um, they, when, when he asked, when the mayor asked, which I thought was telling, Do I, is there any support to move this forward for an official vote, all we heard was silence in the room. And they, they showed their colors, and, and uh, hopefully in November we can, we can make some changes or when they're up for election. Very interesting. Uh, if local residents are concerned about fair wages for people working on public projects for their city, whether it be Ham Lake or another city in their area, who can they call? Who should they contact? They should contact the various city council members that turn their back on them. Uh, they, should go, they should Google Ham Lake and find their emails. They're on there. They should send them a note. They should, they should, the phone number to the city council or the city is on there. They should call the city and say that they're very concerned that you know, workers are, are not being treated fairly, construction workers in Ham Lake. All right, excellent. Thank you for joining us, Mr. George. Thank you, I appreciate Good it. Good luck in the future. Thanks. On November 3rd, just, a week, just over a week after this show is taped, residents across the Anoka Hennepin School District will go to the polls and decide whether an existing property tax levy will continue or not. At stake is about $8 million per year in school district funding. Tight times have already impacted our schools. Governor Pawlenty's decision to delay 27% of school district funding by one year is already costing our schools greatly as they need to resort to short-term borrowing to cover costs while they wait for the state payments. Anoka Hennepin School District has responded to this financial challenge. Uh, including making, by making the tough but necessary decision to close several local schools in the face of declining enrollment and reduced state funding. The district is also far from maximizing the amount it can collect in property taxes, receiving about $400 less per student than is allowed under state law, and having made the decision that these difficult financial times are no time to ask, more than, ask for more than property taxes are currently paying, plus a little inflation. At a cost of around $2 per month for owners of a $200,000 home, the renewal of the existing levy has a modest impact on our pocketbook. In my mind, maintaining quality schools is worth that much and more. That's why I support the renewal of the Anoka Hennepin levy, and I hope you will as well. That's it for this episode of the Anoka County Eagle. Be sure to visit our website, anokacountyeagle.com, where you can view all of our episodes, read our weekly articles, sign up for email updates, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks very much, and see you next time.